This is what's called the intermediate state. That's the $5 word for it, the intermediate state. We as Christians have disagreed on this for a long time, and as a GCI article says that I was researching for this, differing views must be respected. In all things love. Now, is it necessary for your salvation that you have the answer to this question? No. Does this question not matter at all? No. It's part of our life with God. First, some background. I heard an analogy recently of Christ as the magnifying glass of our faith. What's outside of that magnifying glass is sometimes unclear and blurry. What's inside is the most vivid and clear. Some doctrinal issues are unclear. The, this particular question is very unclear in the Old Testament. People died in the Old Testament. Nobody was quite sure what happened after that. That was clarified as the Old Testament went on. And as they got closer, as Daniel was written, there was more clarification of that. Jesus brought the ultimate clarity to it, the center of the magnifying glass. But all the way back, like we read Ecclesiastes last summer, there was a lot of doubt as to what happened when you died. A lot of people didn't know. There seems to be an understanding of the afterlife as the place of the dead or Sheol, a shadowy place that was neither good nor bad. And by the time Jesus was on earth, there were some more developed thoughts on this. It's just some background of the question, an understanding of it at the time Jesus himself was doing his early ministry. So Waldo dies, and what happens? Many of our brothers and sisters believe in an immediate conscious experience of God's presence after death. They believe that Waldo goes here, to heaven's waiting room. And as soon as he breathes his last, to wait for the great resurrection at the end, as described in 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 20, and several other passages. There are plenty of Bible verses that are used to support this. Here's something to write down if you want to. Luke 23, 43. What verse is that? Jesus turns to the guy next to him and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Seems to be a discussion of a conscious experience that will happen right away, that very day. Or 2 Corinthians 5.8. Boiled down, this is absent from the body is present with the Lord. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. This is Paul's sort of famous saying on this. The picture gets more vivid when Jesus discusses the rich man and the poor man in Matthew 16. So, yeah, I handed out that worksheet thing. You can open it up and put references on it, if you're a put references on it kind of person. Um, the poor man dies and goes to Abraham's bosom. The angels take him to Abraham's bosom, as it says in the scripture, whatever that might be. The rich man dies and goes to Hades, whatever that might be. Is Jesus describing some sort of waiting room experience, some kind of middle space that we will be in? We don't know. And yet in Matthew 16, he's telling a parable. Can you base your theology on a parable? All sorts of questions. But this waiting room answer is the answer to the question for many, many, many people in Christian history. This is a popular understanding among evangelicals like ourselves. You'll find it taught all over this, the place, and there's solid scriptural proof for it. At the same time, most of the scripture that we see discusses the great resurrection at the end. There is not a lot of scripture spent on this intermediate state, whatever it is. Again, in necessary things, unity, in uncertain things, freedom, in all things, love. Now, there are other theories about what happens during this time. This one might be particularly familiar to you. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul talks about those who sleep in death. In John 11, Jesus says that Lazarus has fallen asleep a phrase that is used all over the place in the New Testament to refer to those who have died. Thus, the theological theory arose that the soul sleeps to pass the time between the death and the resurrection. 
some sort of suspended space, state, a lot like sleep, during this time. This has been a minority view in Christian history, but a thread that has existed since the beginning. Most familiar to many of you is a certain radio personality that believed in this and talked this more strongly on Catholic sacred tradition, the words of the popes, and other people like that in the Catholic Church than it does on Scripture. The scriptural proof for this is, is particularly small. As Protestants, we will look for foundations of every doctrine, and Scripture is the ultimate authority. And uh, the one Scripture probably that, that would coincide with this is 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Now, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. There are those who are smarter and stronger and deeper in their faith than me, or I will ever be, who believe this. I don't believe it. It seems to undercut the sufficient grace of Christ. What else should we need to prepare us for the presence of God? That's a whole discussion in itself. Material, that we step outside of time or across time, whatever you want to call it. They interpret most of the waiting, scripture, waiting room scriptures in this way. The next second we are aware of will be the resurrection. This view seems to be popular with theologians today because people don't try to answer every question every more, anymore. We've seen the damage done by being certain about uncertain things to us, to our family of faith, all those questions. And so we choose to let the scripture have its mysteries. The end point of all this, whether we sleep or are purged or in some kind of waiting room, is that we await the resurrection. We await the time when God's kingdom and the kingdom of earth are made one again. God's kingdom and the kingdom of earth are made one again. As we read in Revelation chapter 21, one of my favorite verses, favorite passages of scripture, Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's a Greek version of I am the A to Z. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of the alphabet. One thing we know from theologians is that the dimensions that John uses to describe the New Jerusalem here are the dimensions that he thought were the dimensions of the whole earth. So his readers at the time said, that's everything. That's all of it. The new heavens and the new earth don't destroy the universe, they resurrect it. Just as we are resurrected, just as Jesus was resurrected, so all the universe will be resurrected. So when we go to heaven, what we ultimately mean is that we will be in Christ's presence in the new heavens and the new earth through all eternity. Just as Jesus' resurrected body used his old body somehow, so the whole universe that we live in will use itself again. Will somehow God will use that and resurrect it. And we will live in it with resurrected bodies, our true home. The painful side of this reality is that not a 